Live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California, it's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley for theCUBE. This is our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with our, my co-host, Jeff Kelly, Wikibon.org, Chief Analyst of Big Data. Getting to the end of the day, Jeff, you ready for the second wind here? Come on. Uh, we're at the end of the day, we're, we're right at the midway <laughs> point. The midway. Okay, Jika Chong, Head of Data Science with Simply Hired is here with us. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Um, Thank you. You're a graduate of uh, Carnegie Mellon, you're involved, uh, you've got a PhD, you're a doctor, you take doctor. Yep, Say Dr. Chico, sure. okay. With well, two doctors on in one day, two <laughs> PhDs. Uh, a lot of PhDs in, in the big data world, obviously. Yes. A, lot of, a lot of computer science, math, um, a lot of stuff going on. So, um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing on. I want to get your, also your perspective on machine learning. Is it hype? We heard two counterpoints today. It's just a, you know, hype up, hyped up, and some saying it's the next big thing. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, so uh, I joined Simply Hired about two and a half years ago to head their data science practice. And uh, Simply Hired, just a short intro, is a search engine, a job search engine. Uh, we serve about 34 million people uh, every month. And uh, the position uh, there really started with the focus that we really need to help job seekers in that really dark time right after the uh, financial crisis. Mm -hmm. In 2008, after 2008, 2010 timeframe, um, if you look at, look at the statistics, we're really in that huge valley in terms of the uh, uh, unemployment rate, uh, 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 or employment rate. And um, that was the, uh, that's the position uh, I'm at. So what about the, the, the practical matter? Because mm -hmm. so Simply Hire's been around, we've been following that platform for a while. Yes. Um, unstructured data and, and Hadoop, you guys were around on the front end of that as a company, so the LAMP stack, obviously you probably have a lot of MongoDB possibly in there and other stuff, LAMP stack, normal databases, but Absolutely. what has been the evolution of big data? Because now with, with unstructured data, the database models change. Have you guys transformed that? Can you give us some insight and what has that enabled for value? Yes, so part of the value that we provide is to turn a lot of unstructured data online, like the job postings that uh, we aggregate from online sources into a structured form such that people can s uh, to search for it. And in that process, uh, we aggregate about 10 million job postings every day. Um, there is that process of turning all that data uh, into a structured form in a uh, Lucene index, uh, we're using solar now, and uh, in that process, uh, we have a workflow that co uh, converts all that into a database for our search index. Now, some of that workflow is dependent on how well we can extract the structure out of the unstructuredness of random blurbs of text that people post mm -hmm. online. Um, and with the analytics side of it, with over 100 million um, job seekers event that we monitor and generate on our website every day, mm. uh, we dump all that uh, onto uh, Amazon S3 um, as the logs come in, and then analyze that um, continuously uh, with uh, and dump those into Redshift. Mm -hmm. So we found uh, Amazon Redshift was amazing process, but we didn't get there first. We were using Hive queries first, which was effective, uh, but wasn't um, the kind of speed that we were able yeah. to have the data science team be pr productive. Did you also find the admin side was difficult and challenging? I mean, if you, because HBase, Hadoop, Hive, these are all awesome tools. Yes. Performance, extra bulk is <laughs> needed on the hardware side. Yes. Provisioning and also labor. Did you find that to be an issue? Yes. Or is that, is that what the reason why you went to Amazon? Well, um, those were uh, issues in terms of we have to delegate resources in order to handle that. Um, the part, uh, well, we, we have been using all those tools on Amazon uh, clusters all along. Um, but what really made the difference was uh, two key decisions. One is democratizing who can have access to the data, uh, having something that uh, a typical SQL, uh, someone familiar with SQL queries can use is one thing. And another side of it is how fast they can have access to it. Before we adopted uh, Redshift at the beginning of 2013, um, well, 
uh, we had to write Hive queries, and mm -hmm. uh, a large amount of time of the data scientists were in the ETL spa is the state uh, or situation, mm -hmm. rather than the uh, analytics situation or the learning situation. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a huge help. But once we had uh, Redshift, we were one of the first adopters of Amazon Redshift mm -hmm. as soon as it came out of beta. Um, we were able to you know, get a whole team of interns on it, mm -hmm. and the interns loved it. And like <laughs> two of those interns actually became full-time employees in our data science team after that. Mm -hmm. So on the um, machine learning question, so sure. bad, competitive advantage, Absolutely. native, born in the cloud, born in the app world, I mean, what is that all fitting in? So for the machine learning side, um, there are multiple aspects of machine learning that's being done at Simply Hired. Uh, there is the natural language processing side where we're bringing structure out of unstructured data. You know, a typical challenging problem is uh, the government, I mean, the, the job posting space is highly complex. The government classifies course classification, uh, all the jobs into 1,110 categories. And uh, we actually classify it into even more refined categories underneath uh, in order to interpret, uh, for example, estimate uh, what would be the salary for a job mm -hmm. um, that we would be able to use to filter and assess and mm -hmm. make uh, job search results more relevant. Um, and then, so that's the natural language processing and structure, uh, unstructured to structured side. There is also this other side about the business, about user interactions, about personalization. And those, uh, because we're generating the event, we're generating the um, signals, uh, they are structured to start with. So it's a little bit more easier to analyze uh, from the structured, unstructured side, but a little bit more harder to look at how to bring out the real knowledge mm -hmm. uh, from it, because you know, there is a lot more interpretation that's involved. And right now, we have several effort in how to bring those uh, to produce return on investment. So for example, uh, increasing relevance based on uh, our previous uh, job seekers' um, behavior on our website uh, produced uh, a project that uh, gave us 6x return on investment. And uh, over a million dollar uh, in additional revenue just was one project alone. Mm -hmm. Are you guys doing any external signal extraction? Obviously search engines, other sites, and, uh, and what's the strategy? How do you look at that? Also you have your working data of your existing profiles. Absolutely. Um, are you guys doing any cross correlation between that and you can share some ideas that you guys are working on? No, that's a great, uh, great point. Uh, for example, um, for you know, salary data, for example, is highly contentious. Well, where do you get the real data about salary? Well, oh, the government. Lies about their salary. <laughs> <laughs> w2 is what I say. Come on, you know. But that's an important one, right? That's a what very important one. At? So there are uh, statistics, for example, from the uh, government that people do. Uh, the government does surveys mm -hmm. about, uh, like, for unemployment um, benefit purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also other data sources, like user generated, like people uh, would uh, post their salaries on some sites like. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, salary.com. Uh, and then there are other ones where the employers are including some amount of salary information in the job posting itself. Mm. So with all these sources, um, how do you, you know, for the same job title, there are varying um, types of uh, data that we get. And when we were doing some of these benchmarking, we saw that, well, self-reported data are usually higher than average. Um, <laughs> and uh, the um, government sources are somewhat okay, but somewhat lower than what we usually <laughs> expect. I'm not saying anything <laughs> about <laughs> the intent there. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. and then, you know, for other sources, like the self-reported ones from the employer side, well, that was an interesting piece. Um, mm. What we found was that was consistently higher than average, mm. and it, it sort of makes sense because, you know, why would you show how much you're paying if you're paying less than average, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you, right, and, but, but you, you take that all into consideration yes. uh, when you are saying, here's what the you know, average salary is for this position, or whatever, you, you know that some of the self-reported uh, salaries are going to be higher, so you take that in, into consideration, that's part of what the data science is all about. It's part of uh, understanding the landscape mm -hmm. and always be critical about any data sources that we get. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we were talking briefly before we came on air about uh, building a data science team and, yes. and trying to find that perfect data scientist that, that has all the skills you need from statistics to um, the communication skills to uh, the domain knowledge, et cetera. And y you take a little bit of a different approach, and probably born out of uh, real, world, real world experience. Talk a little bit about how you approach that at uh, Simply Hired. 
Yes, so building a data science team is a challenging one, especially if you look at the job board out there uh, in the conference. Mm -hmm. You know, all those companies uh, like Uber and uh, Google and you know, all those different companies are competing for the same pool of resources uh, in the mm -hmm. Silicon Valley uh, location. So um, at first, you know, we were looking at the data scientist that has a broad range of experience. But those were actually really hard to find in the first place, and even when, they, when we find them, mm -hmm. uh, they may or may not uh, be coming to a particular company because there are so many different companies competing yeah. for Or them. if they come, they may not stay long because get, they're going to get another offer next week. That's right, yeah. So um, what we found was that, um, what was triggered for me was DJ Patel's uh, 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 conversation about the data science of the team sport, mm -hmm. um, that it's really about building a team. Right. So now we have experts in uh, data science, but more leaning towards natural language processing, data science that are highly competent, but are really good software engineers, and data scientists that are PhD in physics or material mm -hmm. science or other places where they're bringing very distinct set of knowledge to uh, the space. So for example, for uh, our operations field, uh, for optimizing how uh, we can optimize our internal processes with different channels that we're bringing is an optimization problem. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not a very common data science, like machine learning kind of background. Mm -hmm. So, but we still need it. And it's that variety of expertise that we're beginning to be able to form and we're seeing that we're reaching critical mass and um, the, the speed mm -hmm. and the velocity of uh, producing new product and services. So it may, it may, cost you more because you've got more bodies, you've got more people, but if, if it increases productivity to, to such an extent that your, your ROI essentially on that model uh, is delivered very quickly and then it's you know, onwards and upwards. Absolutely, and one little secret there is all these data scientists, they're smart people. So they may have a certain set of background uh, that uh, they can bring uh, to a project that they can start with first, but you know, given the landscape of the specific company, they can adapt as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and sometimes it's actually a benefit for a company our size, simply hired with about uh, 150 people, where we're providing the data scientists an opportunity to work with the BP of marketing, BP of sales, mm -hmm. and looking at real world problems and allow them to grow beyond their original uh, scope of knowledge. Mm -hmm. They can grow their careers, and, but Absolutely. you also bring up another good point, is bringing in you know, data science as a team sport. Uh, are some of those team members the business people, people who are not data scientists? Um, yes. Talk about how you, how, how you broker those relationships inside uh, of Simply Hired. So that's actually one of the things I tell my data scientists, uh, even before they become data scientists at Simply Hired, is there's something they need to be prepared for. I mean, many of these people are very smart, uh, are top of their class, uh, have been um, very good at communicating to their peers who are data scientists or who are scientists in their field. But then when they come to the industry, they're beginning to talk to people who have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> 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 so th what you're speaking about, uh, Jeff, it's definitely a challenge, but there is a certain characteristic that we're looking for. Uh, yeah, for so the you can talk about the, uh, some of the, the cool stuff that's going on in your, around your world. Talk about the future of things like neural networks and um, yeah, actually with social media, it, the internet of things uh, is people too, and people are things. Thing one, thing two is a famous book I used to read my, to my kids, but it's not just sensors, there's probes out there. You're oh, yeah. searching all kinds of, of data. There's active data, there's passive data. Are we in a distributed neural network that's just going to turn into one global tissue of, of knowledge? I mean, what's the deep learning vision? What do you, as the PhD, how do you look at this? I mean, is <laughs> you, do you like, what do you attack first? Where's the, where's the sequence? What's the progression going to look like to get to that AI, that value that people talk about? That's a really deep question. And, um, Okay, we only got two minutes, go. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> only kidding. Well, <laughs> the, uh, the challenge here is really, you know, how do we communicate with those line of knowledge? I mean, each one of us have this wetware, like this neural network within ourselves. Um, but the thing is, training between people continues to be a challenge, right? So how do you uh, pass information from one person to another, one data scientist to another, uh, the data science team to the rest of the organization, and the organization to the rest of the world in terms of what data science product and services that you can expose to the rest of the world. Um, so in terms of, uh, on, in the fundamentals, the deep neural network training side, 
you know, part of the advance in the past few years um, is, you know, Jeff Hinton's uh, technique for you know, being able to train the deep neural network without a lot of training data, um, uh, self-train the deep neural network, which is sort of what humans do, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we get some feedback, but often we don't know what we're trying to learn uh, when we're two years old. Um, but another area of it is the speed at which uh, the machines are learning. So the GPU, the, the networked uh, training algorithms, the Google Brain, and all those technologies allows us to learn much faster. And then one step higher, those learnings then need to be adapted to the product and services. Right now, my research team is working on bringing some of the uh, more abstract um, algorithms from uh, Google Research Labs, like the Word to Beck, uh, into how to make those algorithms work for helping people find jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then those, when they become product and services, becomes the channels with which we can communicate to the rest of the world in terms of linking together um, how different companies and how different industries could work together. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. The algorithms are, are one thing, but it's how you apply them that's really where the value comes in. And the speed of communication yeah. between the people who mm -hmm. know those knowledge. Um, we've only got time for one more question. I wanted to touch on uh, you know, what you're seeing over the show. Um, in terms of you know what's getting you excited, uh, you mentioned you were yesterday. You were at the kind of the hardcore data science day yesterday. What yes. was kind of uh, what, what did you take away from from that event? The industry is evolving, right? Uh, like uh, what many have observed uh, in the previous few years, people were talking about the technology, and that has been building up. But um, one of the areas uh, that I did my PhD in was how to help domain experts better use highly parallel computing platforms. When I was doing this <laughs> 10 years ago, I was, uh, I was looking at high-performance computing, but mm -hmm. now everything is high-performance computing. Even like your laptop or your um, um, uh, iPad has a GPU that is you know, of the supercomputer capability of yesterday's. Um, so now with those platforms, um, what is still a challenge is how those platforms can actually help the applications. And what came out uh, from yesterday's hardcore data science uh, track was there is a lot more uh, intelligent people who are uh, experts in the application space mm -hmm. now realizing that if they uh, make their infrastructures more broadly adaptable, uh, in other words, make their applications into application frameworks, then mm -hmm. a lot more people can take advantage of the underlying platform. Mm -hmm. And like I think six or seven talks out of the day's talk, the majority of them actually were talking about application frameworks. And many of them may not even have mentioned the word application frameworks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And well, that's you know we've, we've been one of the themes we've been talking about over the last couple of days is where are all the applications, and part of it is, um, as you said, a making a developing a platform that enables other people to continue to build out applications, and that. Part of the reason we haven't yet seen a huge kind of proliferation of these kind of applications yet. Doctor, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you. <laughs> of course, I have to say that it's a PhD. But appreciate it. I mean, <laughs> Carnegie Mellon, uh, just quick plug. I'll give you the final word. Um, the most exciting thing that you're jazzed about looking at the ecosystem, certainly the show here, is just a context to what's out there. What are you really excited about? I'm actually really excited about the government role in all this. I mean, uh, this morning uh, at the keynote, we saw that DJ Patel, first chief data scientist of the United States of America, and uh, I personally experienced um, how uh, the government is really looking at how to use data to help. Uh, last year alone, um, uh, Simply Hired was, uh, I represented Simply Hired to, uh, and went to the White House. Um, to take part in data jams on how to bring new technologies to help people find jobs. Um, and uh, through that process, I met many government officials, people in Census Bureau, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, who are excited about helping job seekers find jobs. And now, as we see the um, employment rate uh, increases and unemployment drops, uh, I mean, I see that the government role, there is a large part of the government role in that particular ramp, and I see the effort there, and it's a pleasure to have been a part of it.
Well, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Again, DJ's awesome. I mean, the first data science, you got also a lot of action going on under the administration. A lot of tech folks in DC now, certainly the XVMware guys over there. Uh, and you got some you know, Google folks in there now. So CTO is fantastic. So yeah, with Megan Smith and whatnot. So this is theCUBE, we're live in Silicon Valley, extracting the signal from the noise. It's open, it's a great environment here, great stuff. Open source is, is leading the way. Certainly a lot of change in data is helping the government and, and, and businesses. We'll be right back after this short break.